introduce today's speaker. Good afternoon, everybody. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sashi Pereira. Dr. Sashi Pereira is an investigator in the Brain Health Research Program at Population Health Research Institute here in Hamilton, an associate professor of medicine neurology at McMaster University and a stroke neurologist at Hamilton Health Sciences. Her main research focuses on secondary stroke prevention, cryptogenic stroke, and uncommon causes of stroke and the optimization of clinical care in this patient population. She has served as principal investigator and co-investigator for phase two and three clinical trials and is on the adjudication committees for international multi-center stroke and cardiovascular trials. She has won research awards and her work has been published in high impact medical journals. She's the lead investigator in the Young ESIS Longitudinal Cohort Study and CADIS ICAD study. Her research has been funded by HHS, PHRI, and CHIR. Welcome Dr. Pereira and we'll hand it to you for today's presentation. Thank you, Steph. Thank you for that kind introduction. So um, welcome everyone, good afternoon. Um, I, I want to say like, uh, please, uh, uh, I, I do want to make this interactive. I know with the, in the webinar format, we would not be able to do that that much, but please keep the questions coming in the Q&A and Steph would be able to monitor them. And if we, if it is relevant to what we are talking at that point, we can try to discuss that at the point or else we'll have time at the end. So uh, we'll talk about stroke recognition and etiology of stroke in the young. It's a vast topic and I hope I'll be able to cover some of it at least today for you all. Um, so the objectives for today would be to review the epidemiology, uh, risk factors and causes of stroke in young adults. And I want to discuss an approach to investigating young uh, stroke in the young using case-based pre presentation, a case-based discussion. And anytime, uh, as I mentioned earlier, please feel free to type in any questions, um, use the Q&A rather than the chat, which will be easier for us to monitor. Okay, so before we um, jump into the etiologist, just to give you some numbers, um, stroke is one of the leading causes of death and disability. And um, unfortunately, there are still there is about 12.2 million incident stroke cases worldwide in 2019 when the global re um, uh, disability registry went on. Uh, they found that there was 12.2 million incident strokes. What's um, um, good for us is stroke incidence in older adults is reducing. However, unfortunately, the incidence of young onset strokes has been steadily increasing since the 1980s. And uh, we'll talk about what could be the causes for this. Um, but before we decide, uh, jump into that, we need to decide who is a young patient. Again, there's various definition for stroke, particularly uh, in all the registries and the trials we have. We have been using the definition as a, a young patient is defined as a patient younger than or equal to the age of 50 years. And uh, about 10 to 15% of first ever strokes occur in young adults. So that's not an insignificant number. And what's more important is in this population, traditional risk factors are not very frequent and uncommon causes, which is, uh, not, which is uncommon in older adults is much more common in this younger group. So we have to have open mind when investigating them and have to do like targeted investigations. Um, looking at mortality and morbidity, the overall mortality rate um, is not too high in young adults, but when you look at it like one in 20, 20 patients would um, die of a stroke, even young adults, compared to like one in five or one in four um, young um like older adults. However, um, even if it is one in 20, that's a high rate. So we have to do better in preventing these strokes. And overall recurrence, again, compared to older adults is lower. However, it's about 1.5%. And it depends on the cause too. Like uh, for example, if someone has PFO, it's about 1%. If someone has uh, atrial fibrillation, that might go up, but overall it's about 1.5% for young adults per year recurrence rate. Functional outcome is uh, again, something we have to worry. It's significantly better on average than uh, old adults. And one thing that we have to keep in mind only 
um, one third of patients would have complete recovery to reach MRS of zero. So this is significant because most of them are in the prime in their prime years, and they are the breadwinners of the families. They have young families, so this is where it becomes very important. Prevention becomes very important. Um, 60 percent would have mild to moderate impairment, MRS one to three. I would say for a young adult, like a three MRS would be so disabling, they would be not be able to return back. Most of them would not be able to return back to their work as they used to do. Um, and uh, about 10 percent will be left with severe impairment. So when you look at stroke etiologies according to age, um, we know in older adults, like adults more than uh, are older than 50 years of age, atherosclerosis, uh, the traditional risk factors causing atherosclerosis, like diabetes, hypertension, hypercholesteremia, smoking, is very high. And about 25 to 30% would be from atherosclerosis leading to large artery disease. So it could be carotid, it could be intracranial large arteries. And then about 20% would be secondary to um, arterial sclerosis, like lacuna stroke, that is secondary to small vessel disease from hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia, causing um, arterial sclerosis and um, narrowing of those arteries. Um, and then um, most of the strokes would be secondary to cardiac sources like emb uh, embolic sources, mainly atrial fibrillation, but some from the valve disease. That accounts for about 30%. And even in the older population, ESIS, so ESIS is defined as strokes uh, when we've looked at causes, when the patients have at least had carotid, um, carotid imaging and then intracranial imaging and has had a, a transthoracic echocardiogram and has had at least 24 hours of monitoring and they haven't found a cause, but it looks an embolic stroke. It's the clot is coming from somewhere. We just haven't found the cause. And that make about 15% of strokes. And then unusual causes, this is where it's interesting, makes only about 5%. For all the adults, uh, investing time and money to investigate for these unusual causes is not that uh, important like in uh, younger adults. But when you look at uh, younger population, um, that's less than 50 years. Uh, again, large artery disease, small vessel disease, atrial fibrillation does account for about 20% 20 of uh, 20 to 25 percent of strokes, but this is mainly found in between 40 to 50 years. And these uh, patients between 40 to 50 years actually mostly um, behave like uh, old adults too. So they have more vascular risk factors, but most of the others, so dissection, uh, one in 10 patients would have dissection in the younger population. And then ACEs accounts for 40%. That's like, we've done some investigations, like the preliminary investigations, but we haven't really found a cause. And then our rare causes account for about one in 10, and then undetermined, like after all the um, um, causes have, like investigation has been exhausted, like you, you haven't really found a one pinpoint cause for the stroke that accounts for again, about 8%. So um, we'll go over some of the cases, uh, and uh, this is where I would welcome any questions if you have, so that we can discuss the question as we are going. Um, and um, so the first case is a 25-year-old male with left-sided uh, weakness and slurred speech. He was actually very healthy. That day he was... Um, uh, in the washroom, like he was training and he felt like his left side going weak and numb and presented the hospital a few hours later. He was outside the window for uh, TPA or EVT. Um, blood work um, was normal, the initial blood work. CTA was normal. Um, and the TTE, the um, transthoracic echocardiogram was normal. And transesophageal echocardiogram with bubble study showed a moderate side PFO with right to left shunt at rest and valsalva. And 24 hour whole uh, was uh, showed no atrial fibrillation. So this is where the question comes, okay, is this PFO um, significant in his uh, stroke uh, or is it just an innocent bystander? How do we decide on this? Um, 
before we go on to how do we decide like what evidence do we have even like for this PF to be PFO to be significant or whether doing something about the PFO is worthwhile. Um, looking at PFO closure trials, we for up to now we have five RCTs um, with uh, 3,440 patients with a median follow up mean follow up of 4.1 years. So absolute benefit is very small in a very selected young stroke patients. This, this would mean that not all patients with PFO need closure. Stroke rate, even on antiplatelet therapy, so recurrent stroke rate is only 1% per year on antiplatelet therapy. Unfortunately, up until now, we don't have any trials comparing anticoagulation directly, like we don't have good numbers um, for uh, for P versus PFO closure. So PFO closure actually reduced recurrence risk by um, 58%, a relative risk reduction of 0.42, which was statistically significant. Um, just having something in mind for like, okay, how do we explain this to the patient? So now we need to treat, it, to prevent one stroke is 38. You have to treat 38 patients over 4.1 years to get a benefit for one patient. Again, even if it is one patient, there's huge benefit. These are younger patients. We don't want uh, rec uh, recurrent strokes. So this is something you have to consider. Unfortunately, there was increased development of atrial fibrillation. So there was, uh, um, and, and this uh, was relative risk was 4.69. And 70% of them were transient, but 30% was um uh, non-transient, which means like they had to go on anticoagulation. And number needed to harm was 29. So that this is where we really have to balance the risk and benefit because um, number needed to treat is 38, but number needed to harm was 29. And remember, there was some transient atrial fibrillation too. But so deciding when, uh, whether the PFO is just an innocent bystander or pathogenic, as we all know, about 25%, one in four of the population would have a PFO. So most of the time when we find a PFO, it would be incidental. What we need to decide is this 20% who are pathogenic, um, who has a pathogenic PFO. And um, like this says, ESIS plus PFO doesn't necessarily mean a paradoxical embolism. So we have a few tools we can use to decide this. Uh, one is the ROPE score. You can um, um, uh, just Google this and the MDCAL has the ROPE score and you can put the numbers in and it gives you the uh, total, like it calculates you, uh, calculates and give you the number. So ROPE score, you have to, um, like you have to know like, ROPE score is zero to 10. If you are a younger patient, so our patient, 24 years old, no previous risk factors, no previous stroke, non-smoker, would get a score of 10, which means uh, the probability of him having his stroke being related to the PFO is about 90%. This is not analogous to Chad's West score. I want to make this clear because I've seen people mixing this up. So this would mean like, okay, likely this stroke was related to PFO, but you look at the recurrence rates, recurrence rates actually is very low when it's attributed to PFO. You can imagine why. So if you take a um, um, rope score four, that would mean either they're older or has other risk factors and their likelihood of this being attributed to PFO is low. However, they have a higher risk, um, higher recurrence risk. That's because they have other risk factors, not because of the PFO. So we only want to close a PFO if we think the PFO is uh, related or causal for the stroke. Um, and there's another score we can use, the Pascal score. They actually look in, uh, take into account the characteristic of the PFO. So if the PFO is large, uh, large shunts, a lot of bubbles, and or associated with the atrial septal aneurysm, and a high rope score, these are the patients that should go for PFO closure. And if you just select those patients, you can see PF, um, they're likely pathogenic, like the PFO was likely pathogenic, and their rate of developing atrial fibrillation was low. 
Uh, when you select the other group is when you get into trouble or they develop atrial fibrillation and they have to go on anticoagulation anyway. The reason this is important is if patients have to go on anticoagulation, we usually don't send them for a PFO closure because um, that the P, um, anti anticoagulation, the current thinking is anticoagulation definitely is better than antiplatelets. And um, they would be, like the benefit might be the same like PFO closure. Okay. Um, before we move to case two, questions? Yeah, Dr. Pereira, there's two questions uh, that came through in the Q&A related to PFO specifically. Uh, the first question is, what's the relative cost of PFO closure versus chronic antiplatelet therapy? And the second follow-up question to that is, do patients with PFO closure still require chronic antiplatelet therapy? Okay, so um, I'll answer the first second question first uh, because it's easy and I'm not 100% sure about the cost, but we can talk about it. Um, so um, if, if they undergo PFO closure, they still has to be on antiplatelet therapy, not anticoagulation, at least um, for a few months. Uh, previously, we were uh, putting patients on anticoagulation um, uh, the first few months, and then, um, then no, um, uh, no anticoagulation, like then switching to antiplatelets. But one thing you have to be sure is like to take a patient off aspirin, like say antiplatelets, you have to be very, very convinced that the PFO was the cause of cause. So because yes, they can meet all the criteria for the PFO, and uh, we drop score is high, large shunt, we still close, we close the PFO, but like, can you 100% say there was no other cause? So most of the patients um, do elect to, once they look at the side effects and all that, they do elect to go on, continue on antiplatelet therapy. You don't have to, but they elect to. Um, and for antiplatelet versus PFO closure, I'm actually not 100% sure about the anti um, PFO closure, um, how much it costs. But most of the young people choose, like when they are given the option, some of them choose to do PFO closure just because like being on a medication for life is not appealing and uh, anticoagulation is um, not without risk factors, right? Um, we don't offer anticoagulation for patients um, with, with just a PFO. It should be antiplatelet. That's the evidence we have unless they have a DVT or something. So it's either PFO closure or antiplatelets. So antiplatelets are cheap, we know. And uh, if even anticoagulation, most of the um, DOACs are going off patent now, like in the next couple of years. So it's going to be cheaper. However, those are things you have to like discuss with your patient. Okay. Any other questions or shall I move to the second case? All right. Good to move so back. We have a 38 year old school teacher with sudden onset speech difficulties and right sided weakness. Blood work all normal, CTCTA normal, halter no AF. She was referred to us for a second opinion because no cause for the stroke was found. Her, she's had an echocardiogram at her primary center, which shows uh, with bubble studies which showed no cardiac source of embolism. Um, and however, in the body, they have commented on late appearance of bubbles in the left atrium of unknown significance. So she's had all investigations um, that's necessary for like that basic investigations. How, how, um, how, how comfortable are we calling this uh, ESIS? or is this um, late appearance is bothersome? There's only like three, four bubbles. What does this mean? Um, so just to uh, look at this, late appearance of bubbles would mean there's a shunt somewhere. There has to be a shunt to have a late appearance of bubbles. So uh, any bubbles to appear in the left atrium um, in the echo bubble study, there has to be uh, some shunt somewhere. So if not the heart, there's no PFO we know. Um, where could the uh, shunt be? The other places the shunt could be is likely the um, uh, the lungs. So there could be an AV malformation or uh, AV fistula that cause uh, in the lung that causes this shunting. So we need to look at this because a pulmonary AVM and stroke um, can occur sporadically. The pulmonary AVMs 
uh, usually happen with uh, HHT, that's her hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia. That's a, um, a hereditary uh, cause. Um, and most of the time when patients have that, they present with other symptoms, um, like they have telangiectasia, they have bleeding, nose bleeding, before they have a stroke. So that's when they have that, we have no problem of knowing that, but then it can, in 30%, it can happen sporadically. It is, incidence is about two to 3%. And risk of uh, stroke, secondary to PA, um, pulmonary AVMs are about 2.6%. And it could uh, be as high as 25%, depending on the size of the pulmonary AVM. Um, the characteristic features are echo um, with bubble studies would show late appearance of bubbles in the left atrium. And CT, uh, you have to do a CTA or MRA of the chest to look for it. Uh, so it's not 100% um, uh, sensitive, um, but, but you do see most of the time, you do see some kind of um, fistula or AVM there. And the treatment is medical, like either antiplatelets, anticoagulant, or if it is larger than two to three millimeters, you go for embolization or surgery. For our patients, patient particularly, she actually had um, the uh, clots sitting on her pulmonary AVM. And to when you go back in the history, she says she um, she's a school teacher. She was away for the spring break and had a long plane uh, ride um, like um, that was about six hours. And after that, she developed the stroke. So it matches very well. And she had the clot, so she needs anticoagulant therapy and um, embolization depending on type um, on the size of her stroke, sorry, size of the AVM. All right, let's move to the next case. Um, so this is an 18-year-old male with sudden onset left-sided weakness and speech difficulties. You can see the right-sided stroke here. Um, and so he's only 18, no past medical history. His uh, ethnicity is African-American and no trauma or substance use, all the blood work is normal. Um, so you, the next investigation after the CT would be for you to do a CT angiogram. And the CT angiogram actually shows this, like in this carotid artery, there's this web-like um, uh, appearance. It's not uh, atherosclerosis. Um, in our patient, it was very minimal, uh, almost like this. Sometimes patients will have like larger web-like appearance. And in axial images, you can see it's almost dividing this. Um, so this is very important and is being recognized as a cause, um, um, uh, important cause of stroke in the young adults um, recently. So these are carotid webs. So what happens is um, carotid webs are rare. Again, only cause 1% of ischemic stroke, but you have to look for it. If you don't look for it, it's easy to miss in a CT angiogram. And it's uh, common in female and those of black race. And 30% uh, can have recurrent stroke in two years. So that's a high number. That's why it's important to look for that. And management is usually medical therapy, antiplatelet therapy. Um, and if you see clots, so how, how this cause uh, stroke is, because there's a web, like there's a turbulent flow there, and um, there could be clots forming there. So sometimes, um, initially, you might put some patients on anti, um, anticoagulants like heparin, if you see clots, like a free floating thrombus or something associated with that carotid. Um, web. And there's new studies looking at stentin versus endarterectomy, especially uh, if they have recurrent strokes. Um, so this is something, uh, another thing that you need to uh, keep in mind. Um, I don't see any questions. Uh, so let's, oh, is there any questions? I have one quick question, Dr. Pereira. Okay. Um, the question was, is the peak age for hemorrhage of a brain AVM around age 20? Uh, it depends on uh, what what type why why the AVM happened. So um, ar around that age is the peak age. But say like sometimes people have like moya moya disease causing not AVMs but um, causing like abnormal vasculature in the brain. So those patients would have 
ischemic strokes initially because they are having like narrowing of the blood vessels slowly and then they develop these abnormal vessel, vessels and these patients present more with hemorrhage later on in their uh, life. So it depends on why they have the abnormal blood vessels. Okay. All right. So case four, we have a 45-year-old female with left-sided weakness and slurred speech. Initial blood work is normal, um, and her CT um, shows um, a tiny stroke in the uh, pons. Um, sorry, this is the MRI showing the stroke in the pons. Her um, CTA is looking like this, and um, you see a little bit of calcification. She's 45. She has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So you are like, okay, does she have enough vascular risk factors to have this calcification? One thing you have to, when you look at this is, when you look at the basilar artery, it looks larger than usual. Um, so when a basilar artery is more than 4.5 millimeters, it's called a dolichoactetic larger uh, basilar artery. That's a little unusual. All the patients, because of atherosclerosis, uncontrolled hypertension, they can have larger um, dolichoactetic basilar arteries, but at 45, it's a little unusual. So um, in her, like everything else came back normal. And so what do you think the cause of this stroke is? Just, um, we don't have Paul in bit, so, but I'll let you think for yourself. So this stroke in the pons look like it's a smaller stroke, subcortical, could it be small vessel disease? Um, or intracranial atherosclerosis because she definitely has this uh, atherosclerosis here. Um, our ACEs, you don't think it's causing enough narrowing, um, cardioembolic, or would you like more information? If so, what information would you like? Um, just going by here, like just intracranial atherosclerosis can cause like occlusion of these tiny arteries, like these arteries and cause um, stroke. But like, so think for Think about it. And um, I, I will say that I want to emphasize the importance of general examination in these young patients. So for her, it, it would have been like, sometimes we tend to think, okay, she's 45, has some vascular risk factors. Maybe it's just athero, small vessel disease. We can leave it like that. But when you do her general examination, you see these tiny um, angiokeratomas in her back. And that's significant. So angiokeratomas can happen um, normally, like uh, one or two is not abnormal. But in a stroke patient, young stroke patient, if you see angiokeratoma, that's very significant for a condition that's treatable. So this is this happens because of something called Fabry's disease. Um, and it's an X-linked disease. Um, of glycogen storage, it's a glycogen storage disease. Uh, why this is important is it's because of a deficiency on um, of lysosomal enzyme, but you can treat them. These patients, as long as you replace the alpha galactosidase, they'll be a that they will be okay. So they can have multi-system um, multi-system uh, effects. Most of, because it's at sling, most of the time when patients present, it's the males that presents with symptoms, but males actually have, they present early, they have other things than the female patients. So they would have, um, they would develop angiokeratoma, burning, like burn, uh, neuropathies causing burning pain um, and involvement of kidneys uh, before they have strokes usually or cardiac involvement. Uh, female carriers can have a very variable cause, not have anything else, may not even have, I have few patients that doesn't even have angiokeratoma, but tested positive for genetic, like genetic testing was positive for Fabry's disease. So, um, so this is something you have to keep in mind, do, do the exam, even if they don't have angiokeratoma, our genetic lab is okay. Like young patient, you look exhausted other courses, doing a Fabry's testing would be worth it. Okay, any questions on that? Um, There is a quick question here. Sorry, Dr. Pereira. Um, would a patient with a medium AVM in the colon be at risk? So colon be at risk for um, strokes, I'm assuming. 
I, I'm assuming the same. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, because um, that that wouldn't get shunt like the way shunted the way the um, it's usually the heart and the lung. Okay. All right. Great. All right. Case uh, five. Um, two more cases with this, and then we can uh, move to more discussion. So we have a 28-year-old female with a visual disturbance and right visual field defect. Um, this is her stroke. She's had two previous miscarriages in first trimester. She's on OCP uh, now for three years. She again was a referral for us uh, from another center. She's had vasculitis screen. I will talk a little bit about what's the importance or relevance of doing vasculitis screen, or should we do it only in selected patients? Um, so uh, she's had a positive anticardiolipine antibody and lupus anticoagulant and negative beta-2 glycoprotein. These, are, these three antibodies are antibodies we check for antiphospholipid syndrome. And her TTE, TEE with bubble study uh, was normal. So again, questions arising in this case is, is this finding like the finding of antibodies, the cause of a stroke? Does it actually explain her symptoms? Like did it cause the stroke to cause the symptoms or does it explain her previous symptoms? Uh, previous symptoms of like miscarriages and all that. Does she require further investigation and what should be done about it? So let's look at antiphospholipid syndrome. Um, antiphospholipid syndrome, uh, there's a diagnostic criteria. It only has 74% sensitivity. However, it has 98% specificity. So you have to have, um, when you look at the clinical criteria, you have to have vascular thrombosis. It could be arterial, venous, or small vessel disease. So our patient has a stroke that qualifies. And pregnancy morbidity, uh, more than three or equal consecutive spontaneous abortions, uh, less than 10 weeks of gestation. So our patient only had two. Maybe she qualifies, but maybe she doesn't. Um, more than one ex unexplained death of um, morphologically normal fetus ab uh, about the age of 10, uh, 10 weeks, and uh, more than or equal to one premature birth, uh, less than 34 weeks. And then the laboratory criteria is the most important because we have to be careful of interpreting these antibodies. Um, they, we have to have two or more uh, blood work positive for antibodies um, 12 weeks apart lupus anticoagulant, anticardiolipine antibody, and uh, beta-2 beta glycoprotein. The reason we have to have two or more and the percentiles like nine, at 99 percentile is it's a common antibody in other diseases. So prevalence of antibodies is, uh, is about 20 to 25% in young stroke patients. It's usually um, low titers and transient. So that's the importance of repeating them and looking at the titer. And even in healthy adults, one to 7% of young individuals and 12 to 50% in older patients would have these antibodies. Transient usually and low titers you, most of the time. And, common, and they can be commonly found after acute or chronic infections, like most of the, like 30% of children after viral infection and, um, and uh, mycobacteria, syphilis, malaria, uh, almost any uh, viral or mycobacterial infection can cause a uh, transient rise in the antibodies. And some medication we use can cause like um, neuroleptics, quinidine, procainamide, and um, even OCP. So this patient, our patient was in, on OCP, that can cause a rise in antibodies. So how does, um, how does APS, antiphospholipid antibody, cause um, stroke? It causes stroke by two mechanisms, either thrombotic or embolic. Um, very, very rarely they cause a vasculitis. That's very unusual. If you think it's a vasculitis secondary to antiphospholipid antibodies, that's probably not the diagnosis. And it can be associated with Moya Moya syndrome, where your blood vessels narrow down slowly over time, like the carotid arteries, and um, closes off. They develop new uh, vasculature when this happens, but they are prone to ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke. 
Um, so presence of lupus anticoagulant and anticardiolipine antibody uh, causes twofold increase of first ischemic stroke. And anti-glycoprotein antibody causes twofold increase in, in MI. Each ad additional positivity, so if you have uh, two compared to one, is associated with 50 to 70 percent of odds of arterial or venous thrombosis. So in our patient, she um, 12 weeks apart, she did have um, the she did have uh, the antibody still persistent, very high titers, and patient had the two tri first trimester. Uh, about, um, miscarriages and also the arterial thrombosis. So we were very comfortable saying, okay, this is APS. Um, second, what do we do with secondary prevention in APS? Um, unfortunately, in stroke population, there hasn't been um, definite trials. However, there are consensus statements and um, there is studies on other patients like patients um, being affected kidney patients like APSA, APLA patients with other diseases, not stroke. Uh, and there's a consensus about uh, among hematology and rheumatology on um, and guidelines recommend warfarin in these patients. Um, they should not be going on DOAX. That's one of the main contraindications for DOAX because there was a study, TRAP study, that compared DOAX versus warfarin in antiphospholipid antibody, and it was negative. Um, rate of recurrence is highest in these patients if they have triple positive um, uh, antibodies. It's about 30% recurrence over six years. So you have to, these patients have to be on either antiplatelets. So for primary prevention, they usually go on antiplatelets, but for secondary prevention, they go on uh, anticoagulation. And uh, not DOAC, but warfarin. Okay, I think we have the last case. Um, we have a 26 year old female, very healthy. She was actually uh, playing football and uh, was knocked on the head by the ball and developed blurred vision and headache. Next day develops confusion, bumping into things on the right side. So mild naming difficulty. She's not, um, she, she, nothing was sudden onset. She just developed having these. And then she has, there's a family history of um, hearing loss. And she also developed hearing loss around the sensory neural hearing loss around the age of 20. Um, hasn't really been, she's been in investigation, but they couldn't find a cause for it. it other than hearing loss, uh, the family history is non-contributory. Her parents are like um, average height. We'll see why I said that. And she, when um, she had an echo, she has a um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and her uh, blood work is normal. However, her HbA1c is 7.7. .7. She's not a known diabetic. And this is her CT scan. This shows like bilateral calcification in the basal ganglia and the pulvina area. Um, and her MRI shows uh, um, DWI restriction in the occipital region, maybe a tiny bit of restriction here too. So this is very unusual for this 26 year old to have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and diabetes um, and hearing loss. So what do people think this could be? Um, we've done all the investigations. Are we happy keep calling this ACES? Or do you need more invest, um, information? If so, what information would you like? And um, is this cardioembolic stroke, Fabris, because we talked about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with um, Fabris, or is this the entity called MILAS, which is mitochondrial encephalopathy with lactic acidosis and stroke-like episodes? So this is something the pediatric in the pediatric population we see commonly. However, in older population, like older means even um, age, uh, uh, about the age of um, 18, that's where we see the patients. The first presentation to happen then is unusual, but you have to have an open mind. We've had numerous patients presenting and us making the diagnosis of uh, MILAS uh, because they didn't have present uh, at the young age. So um, before going through the criteria for MILAS, it's how you diagnose uh, MILAS is when they have strokes, their strokes is usually like doesn't um, 
um, restrained to one vascular territory. So they'll have a PCA stroke extended to the MCA area. Again, this can happen with normal strokes too, but when it doesn't respect individual like uh, vascular territories, you have to have open mind. And um, there are other features they will have multi-organ involvement, uh, CNS, skeletal muscle, eye, cardiac, GI, and renal. It is a disease of maternal transmission, um, and males and females are equally affected. So uh, usually the stroke-like episodes occur uh, at the age of, uh, before the age of 40. Why we call this stroke-like episodes and not stroke is this is because of mitochondrial failure, and they wouldn't usually, if we treat them um, uh, early on, they does not develop infarction. It's just ischemia that's reversible. So that's why it's important to recognize this. So they are one of the main features they present with, they uh, usually have migraines, family history of migraines. They have short stature. For her, she was 4'10", and her mom and grandmother, maternal grandmother was around five, but her both her uh, brother and the father was like six footers. Um, so sensory neural deafness is another uh, common uh, feature associated with the, that. So diagnosis why if you look at the MR spectroscopy, something called MR spectroscopy, looking at peaks of lactic acid, they have lactic acidosis. So if you look at that, you see there's high peaks in the areas of infarction, that's normal but there would be high peaks of lactic acidosis, which shouldn't be the case in normal areas and the ventricles. So that kind of clinches the diagnosis. Okay. And treatment of MILAS, acutely you treat with um, L-arginine um, and you give it over three days. We can do it in the hospital. Um, but like after the acute phase, um, Unfortunately, there's no good evidence, but people would benefit from going on Q -enzyme Q, uh, coenzyme Q10, uh, idabenone, and riboflavin. Sometimes these people are on this cocktail forever. Okay. And one thing to remember is if you diagnose a mitochondrial disease, so these patients would have seizures too, you have to be careful of putting these patients on um, valproic acid because for seizures, you might put the patient on valproic acid, but that pose um, hep uh, hepatopathy in these patients. And uh, there's few other, um, uh, few other medications you should avoid in these patients. Okay, so we've gone through a few cases. I, um, it's, it's a lot to cover uh, in one hour. However, let's go off uh, approach. So how, knowing all this, how do we approach a young patient? So first you start off uh, with a CT and MRI brain. MRI, I would say anyone uh, less than 50 and sometimes even less than 60, I always do MRI just because sometimes you get to see more evidence of other genetic conditions. I'm, um, uh, I'll go over what kind of genetic conditions you can pick up on an MRI brain. Um, so, and then you have to do a CTA or an MRA, aortic arch to intracranial arteries. That's much, much better than ultrasound scan because you don't see the aortic arch or the intracranial arteries in the ultrasound scan. So any young patients, if you're thinking like, okay, you need to find the cause, not, not probably not an 80 or 90 year old, but like do a CT angiogram or an MR angiogram if you have the ability. Um, and you can pick up carotid dissection uh, in the CTA. You can pick up something, um, the fibromuscular dysplasia, that's a connective tissue condition that can lead to carotid dissection. And which shows like this beading appearance of the carotid arteries is very characteristic. And uh, intracranially, you can pick up atherosclerosis, obviously, but there's like, if you see this beading pattern, you can pick up um, vasculitis or RC, RCVS, reversible vasoconstrictive syndrome. Um, and uh, we talked a little bit about Moya Moya, and you can pick up that. So this this um, shows this carotid artery should be continuous, but it's occluded here. And all this is um, new blood vessels, and it's called puff of smoke uh, appearance in angiogram. So why a MRI is better than a CT is because of all this genetic condition. 
you have Cadacil, Caracil, Col4A1, and RVCLS, all genetic conditions, not too uncommon. We pick up like one of these every couple of months in our clinic. So it's not too uncommon. CTs could look normal, just show the stroke, but the MRI is ab uh, very, very abnormal. Um, so if you, you shouldn't see this much of wide meta changes in a young patient. If you see this, that there's something ongoing on. Saying that, like sometimes there are 48 year old, very badly controlled diabetes, hypertension, um, has an MRI like this. That, that's explainable, but most of the time, uh, if you see an MRI like this in an older, pa um, younger patient, you should uh, have a very high suspicion for a genetic condition. So you've done your MRI and your um, CTA when they present initially, but it's very, very important to do a good history and general examination, including eye examination in these patients. So the history would tell you like if there's headaches, strokes usually shouldn't kill uh, headaches unless it's a PCA stroke. So if there's a headache, there's some differential you think about. And then if they have constitution symptoms like weight loss, like um, uh, night sweats, then you think of cancer, atrial myxoma, endocarditis, vasculitis. And depending on race, you can think of um, like if it's a black race, sickle cell disease. Past medical history is important. Family history, again, as we uh, discussed, is important. And physical examination is very, very important. Short stature, low, tall patients, you think of Marfan's, and skin lesions, Fabry's vasculitis, um, eye examination, if you are not comfortable doing it, like if they have other characteristics, sending them for ophthalmology testing is very important. And then of obviously, imagine we talk about that. And then you go to routine blood work. Everyone gets routine blood work. In young patients, if there's no other cause, I do antiphospholipid antibodies all the time. Um, it's important to send it like before 24 hours if you can, because it because of the transient increase. But if you can't, it's okay to send it day three or four, but you have to repeat them. And very important, a toxic screen, like because uh, cocaine can cause a hypertensive crisis leading to a acute hemorrhagic stroke or, a, uh, or sometimes even um, ischemic strokes. Um, and then you do the EKG um, transthoracic echocardiogram with bubble studies. A transthoracic echocardiogram without bubble study is not really helpful. And every all young patients um, should probably have a TEE if there's no other cause. It's much more valuable than prolonged cardiac monitoring. And additional blood work uh, has very low yield. Don't do thrombophilia screen, uh, protein CS, like throm so unless they have a PFO or right to left shunt, there's no point in doing thrombophilia screening because these patients would not, would only have venous um, infarcts. They wouldn't have arterial clots. So don't do it. And if there's no history suggestive of vasculitis, doing all this and autoantibodies is not helpful, like just cause, uh, just costly to the system. And even syphilis, HIV, depending on their risk factors. Um, and sometimes if you feel like the patient is not forthcoming, yes, doing that makes sense. But these are the ones that has your, uh, the uh, buck for your money. Okay, so by doing those, you, you ruled out large artery disease, cardioembolism, dissection, carotid web, um, RV, uh, RCVS or vasculitis, antiphospholipid antibodies and many genetic causes. And then if all that is normal, that's when I would send for Fabry's testing. Um, and after a good examination, usually I'm able to find at least one angiokeratoma so I can justify sending these patients for Fabry's testing. All right, so that's it. And just to take home points and we'll take questions. So stroke in young adults are not uncommon and are rising in incidence. And recurrence is, is low, however, more loss of disability adjusted life years. And uncommon causes of strokes are common in this young population. That's something you have to remember. And investigation ob investigating objectively will help in etiological diagnosis. All right, thanks everyone. Well, thank you. Uh, we do have about 10 minutes left. If anybody is um, would like to either raise their hand and ask a question, um, 
verbally or if they would like, I see another one has been added to the Q&A. Yes, I'm we just had going a to stop share so that we can see each other and have the discussion. We have uh, had a couple of questions come in, Dr. Pereira. So um, first question is, what about, and uh, my apologies for my pronunciation, Marchia fava big, big nami in young patients. How would that differ from other causes like cardicil, et cetera? You mentioned an MRI. Yeah, so that's usually the MRI has characteristic findings. There's corpus callosum involvement in that condition. So um, that's that's where you would say, okay, this is that there's more um, genetic conditions that we didn't talk about. Um, these are the, the ones I mentioned are kind of the more, uh, common. Uh, they are very, un they're not common, right? They're rare, but from the rare, they're the more common one. But again, that Machia Farma would have um, the characteristic corpus callosum involvement. And there's a few other conditions that has that. So you have to keep an open mind. So, but if the MRI shows that, that that's something you would think of. Thank you for that. The next question is a clarification from one of the attendees asking if you had said that RVCS is hereditary. No, it's not. So reversible uh, vasoconstrictive disorder is a reversible condition, obviously, as the name stands. It's secondary to usually due to many medications. Many of the medications we use um, have uh, these um, uh, cause vasoconstriction. So these patients present with thunderclap headaches. Uh, it's very important to know like thunderclap he headaches would be a headache that maximize its intensity in one minute. Um, if it is over hours or over like uh, even over minutes, that's not a thunderclap headaches. And it's usually caused by it, more commonly now we see because of cannabis use, but even antidepressant, many of the medication we use can be associated with that. And that uh, is not hereditary, hereditary. And you can have, um, usually patients have, it's monophasic. Once you have it, like you wouldn't have a recurrence because you take the patients off those medications, they can have a recurrence event too. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, another question has come through as well. It uh, says, apologies if it was covered, but would you be able to speak to some of the reasons it is believed that stroke uh, is on the rise in younger adults? So a few of the reasons uh, that it, uh, it's thought to be is because of you few of the reasons are like um, the increased use of OCP and um, the smoking um, has declined in older adults, but it's picking up in young adults and also cannabis use, uh, especially like uh, any other, any other um, recreational drug use, right, which are on the rise. And part of it is could be that we are picking it more and more. We are better at diagnosing it and we are picking more. And for example, that um, young patient who had the headache and vision loss, if a MRI was not done, it was a tiny stroke, we might not have picked up, um, uh, on the CT, we might not have picked it up. And she was back to normal within a couple of days. So that's probably because we are comparing data from 1980s, saying that we are comparing data for old adults too. So they are definitely decreasing. So we know it's increasing and our, um, it, the main reasons are thought to be OCP, smoking and recreational drugs. Thank you, Fred. And there's a, another question that's come through. Um, are young patients with acute neurologic symptoms versus those uh, over the age of 50 more likely to present with stroke mimics? So that's what we think, right? So that's where we have to be care very careful because a 28-year-old presenting with, uh, say, even vision loss, stroke would be the last thing in our mind. We'll think of demyelination like MS, even if they present with weakness. We'll think of demyelination, something else, AVM, like, like a ICH maybe, but uh, rather than, oh, migraine without, with hemiplegia, rather than a stroke, because we are trained that way and we all feel, feel, fall to this trap of thinking like, okay, all the patients, even when they have a migraine, we want to rule out a stroke. Um, but younger patients, we have this like thinking, okay, they are not unlikely to present with uh, stroke. So having that open mind, getting the history, like acute onset, like sometimes they don't present with 
it has to be accurate, but in me last, like they don't have to present accurately. So having that open mind, doing the necessary investigations, most of the time, like um, young patients, sometimes like if it's a large stroke, they also have seizures with that. Um, so we've seen them like they get intubated because of that and the examination is deferred because stroke, we are not thinking of stroke. And then um, later on when they have a CT, when they're not waking up, we realize, okay, this is, this is, there was a stroke too. So these are some things you have to think about. Thanks, Dr. Pera. There's one more question that has come through here. I think we have enough time to, uh, to answer it. Um, uh, one of the attendees today shared uh, a, a, an experience with a patient who um, had a young patient who was admitted with, admitted with stroke and diagnosed with MELAS as the cause for the stroke type symptoms, um, was on treatment for MELAS, but ended up with recurrent strokes and um, uh, led to an outcome of being wheelchair bound in less than a year with dense strokes and seizures. The question is, is there any prognosis related to MELAS? So that's a very good question because Mila's presentation is very variable. I have patients in their 60s presenting with their first episode and being diagnosed with Mila's compared to, as you said, like a very young patients who, it, dep it depends on their genetic variants, like how much, um, um, how, how many coding differences they have. So some people present... And so that that would tell you the prognosis actually. Um, it, it, uh, it, so I find the geneticists and the um, metabolic clinic uh, people very helpful in letting me know like, okay, what can we expect uh, in this patient depending on how many variables do have it, they have in their genetic um, makeup. Uh, so that that's how you do the prognosis. Most of the time, yeah, by about 40, 50, they can have problems, like significant problems, even though uh, the stroke-like episode is reversible. But, but as I said, I have patients in the 60s, 70s that we diagnose with uh, mitochondrial disease and hasn't had any problems up until then. Thank you, Dr. Perez. There's no further questions in the chat. Okay, great. Okay, well, thank you. Yes, thank you again, Dr. Pereira, this excellent start to our education series, and also to the audience um, for all of your active participation. So an evaluation link has been sent out. Um, we would ask that you would consider filling it out because the feedback um, really is the main driver in planning education. And uh, there are eight uh, yes, eight, re eight uh, remaining sessions. And so we're looking forward to welcoming Dr. McIntyre uh, to speak on stroke recovery and trajectory for the young patient uh, next week. Okay, so thank you to everyone again, and we'll look forward to seeing you next week.